if we access the key contributors to the healthcare burden across the globe, COPD is turning out to be a key contributor. Its steady rise is concerning healthcare professionals across regions. COPD ranks third in causing death. To make it worse, COPD management becomes complicated, especially with comorbidity. Turns out to be the fifth leading cause of DALES. And still, it remains largely neglected by doctors and the general public. Despite affecting over 400 million people, little research is available as of today. While COPD assessment and management have seen positive changes with effective therapies, long-acting inhaled bronchodilators, gold guidelines, our world is yet to witness a life-changing solution to stop COPD's progression. So, the question remains, what is the way ahead in COPD management? Let's hear from the experts. Hello, I'm Sujit Rajan, consultant pulmonologist at Bombay and Bhatia Hospitals in Mumbai and I welcome you all to season two and episode eight of Healthcare Superstars. In the first season, we have seen some amazing cases of interstitial lung diseases including IPF, COPD and an asthma series as well. In episode eight now, based on audience demand, we move to COPD again. And in today's episode, we shall be addressing the much debated issue of diagnosis and management of COPD in a primary care practice. And before I invite our speakers, I would first like to thank our collaborators, which are the Sri Lankan College of Pulmonology, the Myanmar Thoracic Society, AAA and AOSR from Algeria, APPM, an AFMA path from Morocco, the Iranian Society of Pulmonology, SDNCT and Numonaut from the Dominican Republic, the Panama Pneumology Association and the Yemeni Association for Respiratory Care. I'd like to introduce our first faculty, Dr. John Hoffney. John is a dear friend, uh, has been on healthcare superstars before. He's the past president of the International Primary Care Respiratory Group, IPCRG, and over 20 years has led various educational programs for both primary care and secondary care clinicians. He has over 500 presentations at PCRS, IPCRG, BTS, ERS, ATS, and the ACCP conferences. He's a regular trainer for the undergraduate training program at the University of Glasgow in the University of Aberdeen. John has over 74 peer review publications. So welcome John today, we look forward. And now to introduce our second faculty for today, Dr. Richard E.K. Russell. Richard has been on Healthcare Superstars before and he is a consultant respiratory physician and a senior clinical researcher in respiratory medicine, NDM at the University of Oxford and the respiratory lead at NHS England Southeast. He's also an honorary senior lecturer at Imperial College London. He's a scientific committee member of the BTS and a founding editor of the International Journal of COPD. Richard, his current research focuses on the role of blood eosinophils in acute exacerbations of COPD. He's also a co-patent holder on the device for the remote collection of exhaled gases, including NO. He's an investigator in 16 clinical trials on COPD and has published over 35 peer-reviewed papers. So welcome, Richard, again to Healthcare Superstars. So welcome, John, to our show today. And welcome, Richard. Uh, Richard, over to you for the first case. Please go ahead. Thank you so much. I'm going to talk you through a case and we can have a little discussion. And also, um, maybe give you my views on how this could be handled. This was what you might consider a typical patient. And particularly in these COVID times, when people are being seen less face to face, problems with diagnosis are occurring more often. So this is a patient, Mr. DS. He's a 50 year old lorry driver. Now, this is quite important because lorry drivers don't do very much activity, very much exercise, and don't complain particularly about breathlessness. But he went to see his chief with a cough. Now, of course, a cough is a very common complaint. And it's, a, it's many causes of cough, from many very sinister ones, such as lung cancer, right the way through to much more mild ones, such as post-infectious cough. However, 
coughs a common problem for primary care practitioners to deal with and is also a cause of secondary care referral. The GP saw Mr. DS and examined him. He did record in the notes that he heard a wheeze. So he actually auscultated the chest and heard a wheeze. He took a little history from the patient. He's not, not someone who comes to the practice very often. And he's been a smoker since the age of 17. So he's got a 33 pack years or more smoking history in his lungs. And I would come back as a doc, as a secondary care doctor, I focus on occupation quite a lot. I would come back to the fact that he's a lorry driver. Because again, he may be just sitting up in his lorry, um, driving around and actually smoking quite a lot, which is a significant issue. But anyway, he had a wheeze and he presented with a cough. We then saw some spirometry. So this uh, patient had his spirometry recorded and actually his spirometry was not actually too bad. His FEV1, so that's the force expiratory volume in one second, was 2.45 litres and his FVC was 3.31 litres. This gave him an FEV1 to FVC ratio of 0.73. Now this is not quite normal but uh, it's certainly um, not absolutely diagnostic of, of obstructive airways. Richard, do you feel this is a, a good spirometry loop? Uh, I know uh, John is going to take us through spirometry and what primary care physicians are to look at in a small little talk after your case, but do you think this fulfills the criteria? Well, the patient performed three tests actually fairly similar to each other. That's really important that actually reproducibility is good. And the, all I can say is I didn't do it, but the patient actually um, was reported to have given a good effort. And that's also really important. So they are similar in that way. Sure. The peak flow was reached fairly quickly, which is also very positive. Right. And this is, a, this is a man. And actually men often blow fairly quickly and hard. Right. And so they will reach a peak flow quite quickly. The thing that perhaps was missed a little bit on this spirometry was that actually uh, the ratio was almost obstructive, but also can you see halfway down the decline on the spirometry curve, there is a little bit of a, a sagging, a dropping away. And this could be typical of, of uh, airflow obstruction or early, early airflow obstruction. We sometimes call, it, call this small airways disease. So it's reasonable, um, but it's, if it's abnormal, there's subtle abnormalities which are very easily missed. And as you said, John's going to speak about uh, the detail of spirometry, which we'll discuss later on. And you wouldn't normally do a post bronchodilator for these patients, would you? Or... I think it. I, I'm a. I'm a. This is again something which I think I would discuss. I'm somebody who actually likes what I call quick and dirty spirometry actually meaning it is there it is live and it's done in my clinic with me right away sure because I want to know what's going on then however from a diagnostic purpose point of view correctly this should be post bronchodilator to give the best possible outcome so it's very important potentially to state that actually that would be the best way of doing it sure please go ahead so what happened what did what did the GP do well the GP's got a patient who's got cough he diagnosed him potentially with asthma because he heard a wheeze and he started him on some inhaled corticosteroids, which would be a reasonable initial treatment for asthma and certainly not a necessarily a bad treatment for cough. Unfortunately, this chap missed his follow-up appointments and that's a problem. And we picked the story up nine years later now. This chap's now 59 years old, which is not a great age in any way at all. But he's come back to see the GP with a cough, with sputum production, so things have changed a little bit, that wasn't mentioned before, but also now with breathlessness. Now I really want to pick up on that because it's really important to detect and ask about breathlessness. Remember this chap was a lorry driver, not someone known for lots of activity. So to be breathless, he actually has to be fairly disabled by this time. He was still smoking and he continued to smoke through that whole period. So he now had over 40 pack years of cigarettes use in his lungs. He'd had four episodes when he asked of winter bronchitis. These had not been managed by the GP. These had not been put together, but actually been managed by a pharmacist in an informal healthcare network. Um, that was a problem. He hadn't been admitted to hospital. He'd not actually been to the GP. So that's yeah. not, such, not such an unusual thing. Yeah. But actually this story is a very common one. Yeah, no, I was just wondering because John, you're, you're a primary care physician. Does this, do you see this happening often that the pharmacist gives a prescription or gives some medication to the patient? And uh, what would you do differently if you were the primary care physician? 
So there's a few different uh, potential scenarios here, Sujit, and as you rightly say, it depends very much on the um, health, health service that you find yourself working in. One of the common things that's happening in the UK at the moment is that patients have uh, self-management plans for chronic bronchitis, which involves them being issued with antibiotics and steroids to take when they feel it's necessary. And this has had some uh, good outcomes, but it's also had some very bad outcomes because there seems to be a situation where patients are taking their therapy uh, when they don't really need it. The first time they feel a little bit breathless or they have a cough or they feel tired, they're taking their steroids. And that's not something we really want to see. So we need to educate our patients well. But I think what COVID has done is it's pushed us into a situation where we are different ways of managing our patients. And some of these are more remote than they used to be. And there are pros and cons to that because we might be missing important diagnoses, but we are managing to get treatment to some patients quicker than we might otherwise do. So there's definitely a role for the pharmacist there, but we're finding our we're having to tread carefully to make sure that we don't um, routinely give antibiotics and steroids to people who have exacerbations or chest infections or discolored spit or breathlessness without acknowledging that there might be quite different issues going on with those patients that need quite sure. different treatment. I agree and I guess it's the simplest way out for the patient, get a prescription feel a bit better and go on. So I guess that's what happened to your patient, right, Richard? Uh, he, he, he I, I think it's also the fact, yeah, patients patients will go and find help and patients are sophisticated sometimes at getting help for themselves in their informal networks. Right. But the key, one of the key issues here is from a diagnostic uncertainty point of view is recording these episodes so that we know what kind of patient this is. And if this someone is, we're gonna label perhaps as an exacerbator, that might lead to different treatment. But this gentleman, for nine years, went on getting his medication and started getting breathless. So obviously nothing uh, really was bad enough for him to alert his GP, uh, from what I can see. I think that's right. And I think that's, that's sometimes, again, uh, a good thing because yeah. they're not that severe, but also in general, there sure. may well be missed opportunities. And, and I'll sure. come to that towards the end. Please, please go ahead, please. So. This chap then had repeated spirometry and you can see, this is a typical kind of trace, that things had dramatically changed, okay? Um, his FEV1 was 1.2 litres, so significant loss of spirometry of, of, of FEV1. His FVC had also declined to a degree, but he now clearly got airflow obstruction with a very significantly impaired flow volume loop. And uh, again, we'll talk to more and more about the patterns that we see very often, but this is a, a fairly typical pattern, very severe um, COPD in this way. The key point I want to raise here though, and this is not uncommon in some people, it's unusual in, 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 in everybody, but there'd been a significant loss of those, those volumes and this would not be sustainable and compatible with any way with a, a normal life expectancy. Yeah, he's lost almost half his, his FEV1 in nine years. He that's, has, that's and that's the, in nine years. And right. yeah, and you can lose, I've certainly seen people losing 100 to 120 mils a year sure. over time. And particularly if they're having exacerbations, that sure. can make things worse and accelerate the process. Sure. So the diagnosis changed. Um, and uh, the, the, the clear, there was clearly an issue here with that was severe airways obstruction. And it was referred to me um, for actually some help. I'm not going to go too much into the, de the detail of what we did. However, the GP was quite correctly worried about the breathlessness. As I mentioned, um, breathlessness in, is not normal. It should be investigated extensively and, and carefully, but also should be asked about. And the GP had, had now, the, the penny had dropped that actually this patient was breathless and should not have been. The patient clearly was a rapid decliner, and this is a real worry too. And there was also a need for an accurate phenotype to work out what's going on with this patient and what treatments he needs. And not unreasonably, you might think then because of this rapid decline and this critical age around 59, that actually um, you want, might want to consider interventional therapy so we can use other, other processes in secondary care and also potentially refer on to a tertiary center for interventions which will actually improve this chap's lung function. This was his x-ray and I can't even get it all on the screen. 
um, it's, it's, it shows clearly shows significant hyperexpansion, significantly flat diaphragms, a very narrow mediastinum with very few lung markings, vascular lung markings to be seen, suggesting significant hyperexpansion potentially with emphysema. And this is a pretty, pretty typical kind of a, um, CT scan of a patient very similar. And again, this is set to look for the lungs. And you can see here that there is very few lung tissue to actually be seen. Um, this is obviously somebody with severe um, emphysema, which is a particular problem. And I wanted to draw attention to that in this case, because sometimes emphysema develops in w without significant airways obstruction until late in the game. So a patient may look, particularly men, may look um, really quite well, but in actual fact, um, they are developing severe emphysema even though they can blow a pretty good peak flow or blow a pretty good um, FEV1. So what did I do? Well, I wanted to find out a little bit more what's going on. So we checked out for one and trips in the phenotype, genotype, and this chap has got MZ genotype, which in the context of significant cigarette smoking is a problem would maybe lead to accelerated loss of lung function. He's not a ZZ deficient, which would be the worst kind, but he's an MZ, which has got some deficiency of alpha-1 antitrypsin um, function, but that's not quite enough in general. We check his blood eosinophils. Um, this is an important thing, which we may talk about a bit later on, but actually his, his eosinophil count was actually fairly low, 120 cells per microliter. Immediate treatment. We optimized and maximized his therapy. Three things we did straight away uh, and were clear with him. One, we put him on a dual bronchodilator. His eosinophils are not high enough necessarily to lead to a steroid straight away, and his steroids haven't done him any good. Dual bronchodilators are absolutely the mainstay of therapy for this. Number two, we, we uh, put him through a pulmonary rehabilitation course when he had his treatment optimized. And number three, we actually put him through an effective smoking cessation program to stop him smoking for the future. So those things are all going to affect his prognosis in a positive way. What about the future? Well, this chap with a rapid decline may well continue to decline even if he stops smoking. So we might want to continue long consider lung volume reduction surgery, bolectomy, or even a single or double lung transplantation. Now in the United Kingdom, we transplant people generally up to around the age of 63, 64. Um, so again, it's very important at this age of now 59 that we get to grips with his problems um, and, and actually consider all options for this chap. Otherwise, he's going to be in trouble. Sure. And, and I think, Richard, a lot of the things you mentioned in terms of maximizing therapy could have been done in primary care, you, you believe? The bronchodilator? Uh, uh, many often, yeah. Uh, uh, yeah, very often they do. I think that's a really good point. And, and actually, as John mentioned, it depends upon the setup that you have and that your national setup and the sure. integration you have. Right. Um, and we are generally lucky in the United Kingdom in that we're generally quite integrated um, in that we do, the GPs can order right. often nowadays um, alpha-1 and trypsin genotyping. They obviously can do full blood counts. They can order CT scans as well very often actually depending on local policies and access right. but certainly can refer through to rehabilitation, smoking station, absolutely essential and obviously prescribe appropriate bronchodilators. But I think with this chap he was just um, he was just missed and not really his not really the not necessarily sure. the GP's fault because as, sure. as I mentioned he didn't present in those intervening years. Sure. No, but I think a lot of what you, you mentioned could be done by an alert primary care physician. The bronchodilator could have got on. Rehab, referral is not a big challenge and it would help such a patient tremendously. And of course, rehab could also double up as counseling for smoking cessation uh, and, and therapies if they were required. So a lot actually in the management could be done at primary care, I, I see here. John, do, do you think all this happens or is this a common scenario or an uncommon scenario what would you think this is a common scenario sujit and i think the sad thing is for whatever reason there was a nine year gap right so why did he allow things to deteriorate sure. did he feel he couldn't speak to his general practitioner did he not recognize there was an issue sure. did he put it down to other reasons it's just my smoking did he know that if he contacted a healthcare professional, the first thing they would do is tell him to stop smoking, right. which he probably doesn't want to do, but needs to be reminded to do. Yeah. 
Um, did his GP um, not make himself accessible enough to have a discussion with him? Right. Was he called for regular health checks at an appropriate age where these things could be raised? At the very least, um, encouraging him to stop smoking, probably to exercise a bit more would have helped. Um, making a diagnosis, identifying that he's a fast decliner in FEV1, yep. is going to help an awful lot. That's a strong incentive to stop smoking. To know that you've got alpha-1 antitrypsin deficiency and, and you know the, the, the implications of continuing to smoke, lots of missed opportunities here. Yep. But I don't think we should always blame the patient. Yep. For whatever reason, the patient couldn't or wouldn't um, contact his uh, primary healthcare team. And I think we need to make sure that we're as accessible and open, non-judgmental, supportive as we possibly can be to make people like lorry drivers. You know, I live in Glasgow, a big post-industrial city where men are men and, uh, you know, we are all think ourselves as tough and hard and so on. But actually, um, smoking is not good for you no matter where you are and you need to be able to access advice and healthcare as appropriate. Sure, sure. I, I, I couldn't agree with you more. A lot of missed opportunities there. I think just a, a spirometry test, maybe after a couple of years, down that nine-year gap would have, would have helped, you know, probably pick up a decline. And we know that lung function decline, the decline has begun even earlier than that. So a lot of uh, education could have gone in there. Uh, and uh, unfortunately, I mean, the three things that Richard put up there, bronchodilators, rehab, smoking cessation, everything could be done in primary care. I mean, everything. There's, there's only the real tough ones, that is surgery and the transplant, which really need tertiary care. And I can see that uh, missed opportunities a lot, and we hope that doesn't happen. Yes, Richard, eh? and, and, and do we have the... I would, I would say... Yes, please go ahead. Go. Sorry, I, I would certainly add, I think John's absolutely right. The very important patients think we're going to tell them to stop smoking and that's the the, the, the thing they don't want to hear and in fact we need to be supportive of that and be, be frank and say yes it's really important to do that but actually do it absolutely in a non-judgmental manner yes. and acknowledge what smoking is which is which is an addiction and, and it's not a blame game and, and but patients have that level of, of guilt sometimes which they should carry so we've got to really help them with that and uh, enable them to connect better with us Richard anything further so, on this patient yeah, I'm just going to, I've got two, two yeah, final slides, please. which we've already discussed a lot of this. Sure. Very important points to remember, everybody out there. Everything which you hear a wheeze is not always asthma, okay? COPD can wheeze, bronchiectasis, wheeze, foreign bodies, etc., and include, obviously including lung cancer. So we need to be thinking. And if you hear, one thing this GP did very well was actually make a diagnosis and give some treatment. Unfortunately, they got lost to follow up, which would have been lovely to, to see. And that would have maybe solved the problem. But actually, just remember, when you hear a wheeze, don't assume it's asthma. And then making a diagnosis of asthma or COPD, you know, in typical cases, is very simple. Clinical signs. Um, the symptoms, the episodicness, the variability, maybe just the cough, where COPD has got progressive disease and, uh, uh, and it causes sputum production and cough over time. But it takes time to become established. The objective measures, we've talked about spirometry and we've talked about maybe about tests that you might do for asthma. And then thirdly, you do need to do the follow-up, very importantly. So to conclude about this case, and we've discussed much of this already, what are the lessons learned and the missed opportunities here? Well. I'm really keen, our jobs as doctors is to make a diagnosis. Um, and I really want to be as positive as possible about making a positive diagnosis of asthma or a positive diagnosis of COPD using all of the tools that I've got at my disposal, not just spirometry, not just auscultation, but maybe using nitric oxide, blood eosinophil levels, imaging, and doing challenge testing, asking the right questions about childhood A to B, the impact of breath disease is so important whether we're looking at asthma or COPD, and of course, the exacerbations, we've already discussed the impact of winter bronchitis. And then finally, the last two things really are, confirming treatment response is so important because if you've got someone who's got symptoms that you think they've got asthma, then giving them some treatment, fantastic inhaled corticosteroids is really important for therapy, but you've then got to demonstrate the fact they're better. Did the treatment work? Because in asthma, we would expect it to work. In COPD, not so. And that requires effective follow-up. And as John mentioned earlier on, 
if we don't have systems which talk to each other very well and aren't joined up enough and then, then we, we can miss patients like this and they fall through the Swiss cheese so being integrated is really important. Um, I, there's some tests there I've just mentioned about pet metaclone challenges, pheno, sputomyosinophils, all of which are not perfect, absolutely not perfect, but all can actually help you um, in the diagnosis of asthma. And all, um, certainly pheno is becoming more commonly used in primary care now. Sputomyosinophil count and metaclone challenge are a secondary care test or even third tertiary care tests. Um, but you can use use um, some other tests with, with reversibility testing and um, peak flow variability. So, where did we miss this guy? We missed this guy's opportunity to smoke station. That should have been done straight away. We should have had better links in healthcare services. And I just want people to think about this particular phenotype a little bit. Uh, men, smokers, with relatively normal and relatively preserved spirometry, but can end up with very significant emphysema. So I hope you've enjoyed that. I've very much enjoyed the, uh, the discussion we've had. Um, and um, I'm looking forward to the next section, but happy to discuss it much further. I think it was outstanding. And you know, the recognition of the alpha-1 antitrypsin phenotype, pheno imaging, I think these are challenging for the average general practitioner, Richard. Though I see how much, as a COPD specialist, uh, how much you delve into it to get to the bottom of that diagnosis, to give the best possible personalized care to your patient. So there's, there's no doubt about it that your workup is, is just so comprehensive. But, um, you know, I realize, uh, and I'm sure uh, you realize too, that the average general practitioner across the world has just about got access to spirometry, uh, and sometimes not even that in some parts of the world. And uh, the case was excellent, it highlighted some fantastic points and we're going to have another case at the end of it but what I want to tell uh, the audience is that spirometry is really the base investigation that many general practitioners have. It's not enough as Richard rightly told us uh, but you've got to get your basics in spirometry right and that's why I've requested John to give a short 10-minute talk on spirometry. We are not here to tell you all how to do the test. It's beyond the scope of primary care physicians to sit down and do the test. We need good technicians for that. But I think if you can recognize what is a good flow volume loop, what's a bad loop, where are the issues there, and what to look at in a test, you will probably be much more empowered in diagnosing airway disease and treating it better. So thank you so much, John, for agreeing to this short talk. And I'd, we'd love to just hear you talk before we go to the second case, which you will present. Over to you, John. Thank you, Sajid. Um, you've asked me to run through some of the issues around spirometry um, from a, principally a primary care perspective. And what Sajid, you specifically asked me to do was to look at some of the technical issues. Now, this is quite opposite because the last thing we discussed in Richard's case was somebody who had a fast decline in their FEV1. This famous Fletcher Petal curve goes back to 1977 when I was starting medical school and Richard was probably in primary school. And what Fletcher and Petal did was they described how FEV1 deteriorates over time particularly in smokers. So the red line that you see here are people who are um, declining quickly as a result of smoking. And the top black line are people who, the other situation, the scenario we discussed, people who haven't smoked or are not susceptible to the effects of smoking, who have a gradual and much less severe FEV1 decline over time. One of the important things, and this is opposite to Richard's case, is if we had intervened with appropriate intervention, stopping smoking, encouraging exercise, pulmonary rehabilitation, we may have had a scenario um, of this yellow line where the patient stopped smoking. The FEV1 doesn't improve, but it declines at the rate it would have declined had the patient not smoked. Now, if we look more closely at Fletcher and Pito, uh, Fletcher and Pito um, it's probably not quite as simple as this, but there's a strong, simple message here that if you stop smoking at an appropriate time, your FEV1 won't decline. And this is all around spirometry and frequently measuring FEV1 so we can identify the, identify the fast decliners and intervene appropriately. 
Now, there's basically two types of trace you'll see with spirometry. There's a flow volume loop, and these are the readings which Richard's patient uh, uh, displayed, and also a volume time curve. Now, the good news is that in general, um, all spirometers nowadays will give us a printout of the values we require, such as FEV1, FEC, and the ratios, and a whole lot more, but let's confine ourselves to these two most important uh, features for the basis of this talk. But you'll see there's a flow volume loop which measures the air flow over against the volume and the volume time loop, which is shown on the right here. So if you have abnormalities, and Richard's already shown some of these with the flow volume loop, you'll see how a mild obstructive or a severe obstructive uh, flow volume looks and how a volume time curve is different for an obstructive pattern and a restrictive pattern. In the volume time curve, there, it takes longer for the air to get out, so the FEV1 is going to be lower, the amount of air you produce in one second. And the restrictive shows that you don't achieve your full forced vital capacity. Spirometry is a, a lot more complicated than um, just those two readings, and if you have an interest in lung physiology, this is the kind of uh, graph that you might be interested in, which displays the different uh, physiological measurements that can be made using spirometry. But for primary care clinical reasons, the two most important ones are FEV1 and FEC. So the FEC, the force vital capacity, and the FEV1, the amount of air that's blown out in one second, translates into the kind of uh, clinical uh, values that we use to make a, a confirm a diagnosis of COPD and assess the airflow obstruction in terms of severity. Now, when I was a young doctor, this is the kind of spirometer that we used, and, and this is, gives you a flow volume reading. And I have to say that my early experience with flow volume curves has uh, led me to continue to favor them in terms of my clinical practice, because I've used them all my life and I understand them. These things were genuinely, a, be a bellows spirometer, were genuinely in use for the first 10 years of my clinical life, before things became uh, more electronic. And this is the kind of device that many of you will now have, a micro lab. The one thing I would point out is that a good spirometer will have a paper trace. It can have a visual trace if it likes, but we really want paper confirmation that will allow an observer to confirm that the spirometry tracing is accurate and useful. One of the things you'll see in the bottom right hand corner is that these things are not particularly cheap, but this was from a, a search of a, of a uh, internet search engine that I carried out to the weekend. And um, I have to say that it got uh, five stars from 48 uh, users. And that's the kind of uh, commendation that uh, my wife finds appealing when she's looking on the internet. So certainly considered valuable by our peers. And then the other thing that I want to come back to, uh, we'll, we'll, we'll leave that just now. So Suji was particularly keen that I went through um, some of the uh, anomalies we can see in uh, tracings. So we need a paper trace and I'm, I'm gonna show you uh, some of these now. If you've got a good trace, you'll see that the curve is smooth, has no reg irregularities, curves upwards and reaches a plateau. So this is a very normal, very good trace. But not all traces are like this. This patient, and as Richard said, usually a tendency in women rather than men who are not as aggressive at blowing, didn't try hard enough. So. They got there in the end, but we can't get an accurate FEV1 because the patient didn't blow hard enough and fast enough as is required. This is probably going to get caught in the uh, general procedures because we're going to ask our patient to uh, repeat the, the spirometry and they'll find it very difficult to blow at exactly the same wrong pace. So we should be able to pick up these because of lack of consistency. But what's happened here is the patient has had sub up maximal effort and not tried hard enough. In this case, and this is possibly one of the most common things we see, there's an early stoppage. The patient blows and then they stop. If they'd continued, they would have blown further and improved the FVC. 
The danger here is that by stopping early, what we see is, as a result, is something which resembles a restrictive pattern. And it's important to know that the patient has completely emptied their lungs. Otherwise, we're going to get a restrictive type pattern, which is in fact spurious because it's been caused by early stoppage. The next one is a patient who coughs, and we see these uh, rather strange but um, understandable um, anomalies in the trace because the patient has inhaled and then coughed. So it's an irregular tracing and quite easy to spot. An extra breath is a little bit more subtle, but if you've seen that once, you won't forget it. The patient breathes satisfactorily and then takes an extra breath and continues. The FVC is going to be much higher, but we're going to pick it up because the curve is abnormal. Slow start, very common. So a good blow, but happened too late. The FEV1 becomes delayed, the genuine FEV1. So the FEV1 reading is vastly reduced. So we can actually work our way through them. Here's our correct trace. Here we've got some errors in spirometry traces. What happened here? Here's the correct trace. What's this one? We've seen it before. Coughing. What's this one? Late start. What's this one? It's a breath in the middle. And these account for most of the anomalies that we see when we're doing a, a, a volume time spirometry. This one, early finish, could easily be, be mistaken for restrictive. Now, this little device is something that we're going to talk about later because um, this is very popular. It measures your FEV1 and FEV6 and works rather like a peak flow meter. The patient blows hard for at least six seconds and it will give us an FEV1 and an FEV6 reading. And if, if you've blown for six seconds, it's a reasonable assessment of your force vital capacity. So by using these devices, which are considerably cheaper than uh, full spirometry, about a hundred pounds, 130 US dollars for a device like this, we can have an FEV1 and an FEV6 reading. But what we can't have is a trace that shows that the patient has performed the procedure correctly. We need to discuss that. Much, much cheaper, reasonably useful, but prone to error by the patient. We need quality assurance for spirometry. It doesn't matter if it's done in primary care or secondary care. People say we should have relaxed vital capacities, forced vital capacities, maximum of eight blows, two blows within 5% or 100 mils. We have to repeat it again, perhaps with bronchodilators if we're looking for asthma. That can be quite challenging to both be quality assured and to make sure that the patient doesn't become exhausted by having to do this eight times. It can be exhausting to do spirometry. Now, I want to put this in a little bit of context from the UK scenario. This is a poster we presented at the Primary Care Respiratory Society less than a month ago. And what we did was we looked at the rules for competent spirometry as described by the Physiology Society in the UK and how well UK general practice achieved them. So I'm going to pick up some of the figures and tables. So what we need to be reassured about is operator competency, make sure the equipment's well calibrated. And Suji, this is, can be a problem in primary care more than secondary care where the equipment isn't used every day or ev every morning and afternoon. Patient preparation, correct performance, post bronchodilator readings, and the quantification of a slow vital capacity. These were the, the things we assessed our performers against. And when we looked at the traces, this is what we found. Now, I've spent a little bit of time discussing the poor trace but the poor trace was only responsible for 6.6% of the unsatisfactory spirometry. And some of the more common reasons were insufficient blows, failure to be reproducible, um, uh, no record of VC, um, and so on. In terms of the poor trace, we had an extra breath in a few, a cough in a few, an abrupt end in a few, a slow start, and an indistinct trace, meaning the, the machine hadn't uh, got the right amount of ink in or hadn't printed properly. I would say, Suji, and this is something I want to discuss with you later, that the reason for the small number of poor traces was because of high operator competency. Because the best person to spot a poor trace is the operator. 
the person conducting the spirometry because by the time it gets to the reader, the GP or the specialist, we want to make sure that we have sufficient good traces. And if we're not getting good traces, then the operator should be identifying these and giving us uh, further uh, traces to make sure that we can make an accurate assessment of the patient with the spirometry we have. Now, what we did then, Richard, and this is a point I want to discuss with you, is we had the patients who had conducted spirometry according to the rules, to best practice, and we had others who had some resemble, some spirometry, but not entirely compliant. And unfortunately, you, earlier you used the word uh, quick and dirty. Now, when you said you liked quick and dirty spirometry, I think you meant quick, but not necessarily unsatisfactory. And one of the things I was slightly concerned about looking at these two lists of figures is that there was quite a number of patients had a restrictive pattern in the non-ARTP compliant. And I would suggest this is spurious because of probably stopping too quickly. So we're getting different readings between good spirometry and bad spirometry. The question's gonna be is, bad spirometry good enough or should we uh, completely reject it? So the discussion points I want to have with the two of you now are as follows. Okay, I, I think they're really good questions. Uh, number, you know, in a way, yes, spirometry is important because it's how we de define these diseases. Do I think it, that may be the future? No, I think things will change, but we'll talk about that maybe a little later. Quality assured spirometry is, is obviously really important if you want the right answer. However, the point I was making really about using quick spirometry is that actually if your spirometry trace um, shows there's a problem, it then means you need to go on and do a quality assured spirometry to actually assure it. If there isn't a problem with your quicker spirometry, which is easier to do, then you may not actually have a problem which is useful. So it's useful, as I said, in the moment, um, but it may mean that uh, with my patient, for example, they might have picked up uh, a, an issue um, with a decline or even though the spirometry wasn't done with reversibility, even though the spirometry might have been quicker, which would have then have led to a proper quality of sure um, spirometry being done later, that would have then picked the patient up. And I think that's quite important. Um, and then the FEV6 machines. This is a really, uh, it's not controversial, but it's really interesting that they've not been picked up and they're not widely used. Um, because you, because as John said, they're they're cheap, they're simple. Uh, they certainly have the real problem that you can't assess the quality of the blow, and I think quality of the blow in spirometry is everything, as John showed in his post. And that really, I'm absolutely sure the restrictive patients being overdiagnosed is all about effort. It's all about not taking a big enough breath to start with and blowing it out in the right way. So does FE6 help you with that? No, it makes it maybe worse because they are very much. Um, it, uh, very much don't give any feedback on the effort. Sure. However, once again, they do give you an FEV1. And, and, and actually FEV1 may well on its own have picked up my patient because my patient's FEV1 decline would have maybe heard you could have picked that up maybe at two years. Yes. Um, and now that would have been uh, really potentially useful. So I, I think in certain situations where, where you can manage with just an FEV1, I think that's quite important. Um, then actually, the, these FEV6 machines are actually very useful. Thank you so much. John, over to your second case. Thank you again, Sujit. Uh, I'm going to take you through a COPD case. Uh, one of my patients, this gentleman's called Jeff. He's 62 years old. He's breathless, walking to, his, walking to the shops nearby. And as we discussed earlier, he's in a little bit of denial because he thinks it's just his age. He's not as fit at 62 as he should be. In terms of comorbidities, he's got a little bit of osteoarthritis. He smoked 10 cigarettes a day for 40 years, which gives him a 20 pack year history, which means he satisfies the conditions for having COPD if that's something we decide is on our differential diagnosis list. Meet Jeff's doctor. Jeff's doctor is wearing a white coat. He looks like an American comedian. He's waving his stethoscope around. I have maybe a few doubts about his clinical competence. And Jeff's doctor also thought it might be his age. He didn't take it too seriously. He said, Jeff, you're just not really as fit as you used to be. You're 62 now, but you're here to see me. So I think I'd better do something. So why don't you try this inhaler? Just see if it helps your breathlessness. 
So he gave him a short acting beta agonist, PMDI, spray, press and spray reliever uh, for his undiagnosed, possibly clinically important breathlessness. And Jeff came back to see his doctor and he said, I'm better with this inhaler doctor. I can use it three or four times a day if I need to walk or climb steps. If I'm breathless and I use this inhaler, it works. So thank you so much. What an excellent doctor you've been without doing, without taking any history, without examining me, without been doing any tests. You knew exactly what my problem was and you cured it. So they agreed he should continue his medication. But then Jeff remembered something he'd heard at a lecture at a postgraduate medical meeting. And it was, if you need a reliever, a blue inhaler more than two or three times a week, then you should be on a steroid too. Jeff thought to remember this and he thought that was important. And Jeff had just said he uses it three or four times a day. So shouldn't he be on a steroid inhaler? Well, this is where Jeff, Jeff's doctor got his information from. Your doctor will prescribe steroids for your asthma. They'll prescribe the lowest dose of steroid medication. For example, your GP will prescribe steroid medication if you're taking your reliever inhaler three or four, three or more times a week. Well, Jeff's taking his inhaler three or four times a day. So surely he should be on a steroid. No, Jeff's doctor, that's asthma. You haven't made a diagnosis of asthma. Jeff's a smoker, you haven't made a diagnosis at all, but you certainly haven't made a diagnosis of asthma. So don't confuse asthma and COPD. Jeff's doctor, you're gonna to have to make a diagnosis and you're going to have to understand there are different treatment regimes for patients with different diagnoses. Asthma and COPD are not managed the same way. Jeff's doctor had confusion over pulmonary diagnosis, COPD, chronic obstructive pulmonary disease. I think it's an outstanding example uh, John, the, the example you gave is just outstanding in terms of how many patients land up getting prescribed a steroid inhaler because they're thought to have asthma rather than COPD. And this is so three to four times a week. I love the way you put that across three to four times a day. Gosh, he needs an atom bomb dose of inhaled steroid. And there he goes on to it. So go on, please. I, I, I couldn't agree more there. Okay, so Jeff, Jeff thought he'd better find a new doctor. So we found this guy who seems to know a little bit about COPD. And this doctor had a different approach. He thought he would take a history, consider the comorbidities, look for red flags, confirm a diagnosis with spirometry, check the MRC score, which is two. He can't keep up with his uh, compatriots. I just put this in just in case which part of the world you come from. So the MMRC score and the MRC score are exactly the same apart from the MMRC score is count is counted as one less. If you're going to be dichotomous, if you're going to be binary, the important score is an MMRC of two or an MRC of three, which means you can't keep up with your peers, which means you're functionally breathless. So Jeff had an MRC score of three, which is an MMRC of two. On close questioning, it appeared he has never had an exacerbation. He has not had what he might call a chest infection or winter bronchitis or an episode of smoker's cough or a COPD exacerbation. And our new doctor decided there would be a, a non-pharmacological and a pharmacological management approach to managing uh, Jeff. So Jeff had his spirometry done. He's got an FEV1, FEC ratio post bronchodilator, as we know this doctor always does, of 66%, 0.66, which categorizes him as having an obstructive airways disease, and a post bronchodilator FEV1 of 69% predicted, which falls into the uh, uh, moderate category, but is, you know, it's, it's, it's the, the milder end of what we see in terms of um, obstructive airways uh, conditions. Now, once again, I went to the international guidelines for uh, chronic obstructive lung disease, just to confirm to you that what Richard and I and Sujit are talking about today is based on what guidelines say. So um, we make a diagnosis with symptoms and risk factors and then confirm it with spirometry we must have exposure. We must have exposure to cigarette smoke in the Western world or 
uh, smoking or indoor cooking smoke or something else that would count as a lung irritant um, elsewhere. And then we make an assessment based on symptoms and exacerbation history. We have initial management, we've heard about this already, smoking cessation, vaccination, active lifestyle. This In this list, pulmonary rehabilitation doesn't actually uh, appear, but active lifestyle and exercise is the first part to that and pulmonary rehab is that plus much more. And then in terms of uh, reviewing the patient and adjusting pharmacological, pharmacological and non-pharmacological therapy. Interestingly, um, in previous iterations of uh, gold guidelines, they would have listed the um, airflow obstruction as mild, moderate, severe, or very severe, but they wouldn't include it in part of the assessment in terms of thinking about your initial pharmacological treatment. And I think that's quite interesting that they've dropped it completely until you look at it from a patient's perspective because my patients come in and tell me that they're breathless or they're functionally disabled or they have trouble sleeping or that they've had exacerbations. And I'm still waiting for my first patient to come in and tell me that they think their FEV1 might, FEV1 might have declined 30 mils over the weekend. So spirometry and airflow obstruction is important for the reasons Richard discussed with us earlier. But in terms of choosing your initial pharmacological treatment, we're only interested in two things. One is your breathlessness, as measured by your MMRC, MRC or CAT score. And the second is the number of exacerbations you've had. So in terms of looking at Jeff, he's had no exacerbations, so he must lie in this bottom row. And he's got an MRC of two, which means he must be in this right-hand column, which means he is group B. And the suggested treatment for him is long-acting bronchodilator and no mention of inhaled corticosteroid whatsoever. Now, GOLD gives us some advice. This is the most recent iteration of GOLD as to when to consider initiating ICS treatment. And they are suggesting that ICS treatment might be useful in patients who've been hospitalized, who've had frequent moderate exacerbations more than two a year, who have a high blood eosinophil count, and Richard will tell us about that earlier, or who have concomitant asthma, and you, sh and, and you should not be using it in patients who have a history of TB, a low blood eosinophil count, or repeated chest infections or pneumonia events. So we've got strong support on one side, we've got strong uh, advice against using them on the other side, and somewhere in the middle, the use could be considered. The goals for treatment of stable COPD, and we should always have goals in terms of managing our patients, according to the guidelines, are to reduce symptoms and to reduce risk. They mention risk of disease progression and exacerbations and mortality, but we must also reduce risk of doing harm to our patients by giving them an inappropriate treatment that might cause them more harm than good. In Jeff's case, we're gonna relieve his symptoms, we're gonna improve his exercise tolerance, we're gonna to improve his health status. As a bonus, we're going to help to reduce his disease progression. Now, what's the advice on uh, the risk associated with ICS use? As long ago as 2010, NICE, who provide advice for GPs and specialists in the UK, asked us to be aware of the potential risk of developing side effects, including non-fatal pneumonia, in people with COPD treatment with inhaled corticosteroids. Now, the important thing here is that in the right place, ICS are very useful at helping us to manage patients with COPD. In the wrong place, ICS are going to increase our risk of chest infections, non-fatal pneumonia, and have no benefit. And we know this from Ernst study and from TORCH. So we looked at the, the European Medicines Agency, looked at the risk and confirmed there was an increased risk. One of the things they were careful to say because of disagreements amongst pharmaceutical companies was that one inhaled steroid did not appear to be worse than another, although the dose or the potency of inhaled steroids might be important. So we know from the PATHOS study that there is increased mortality in some patients. We know from this study, which looked at a variety of um, inhalers with different constituents, all made by the same manufacturer. 
So we've got two bronchodilators, a single bronchodilator and a triple therapy, that there was a greater pneumonia risk in patients who were given the triple therapy. Now, if you give an inhaled corticosteroid to somebody who is not at risk of exacerbations, then you increase their pneumonia risk. If you give an inhaled corticosteroid to somebody who is at risk of exacerbations, you reduce the risk of exacerbations more than you increase the pneumonia risk and therefore it's beneficial to the patients. We're going to discuss that shortly. I just want to show a slide I've some of you will have seen before and it's about homogeneity. So this is the city of London which is a homogeneous city. It has a center with bright lights. It has a ring round it which is the M25. The lights which are bright in the center disperse as you move to the outskirts and eventually find yourself in the country shown black. You can see Heathrow at nine o'clock, the very far left. But this is homogeneous, bright in the center and spreading out. This city, which is Berlin, is not homogeneous. On the left-hand side, you'll see a greenish tinge. On the right-hand side, you'll see an orange tinge. This is because 30 years ago, Berlin was a divided city and West Berlin used mercury lights and East Berlin used sodium lights. Now, when we think about patients who need to get um, steroids for their COPD, then we don't think about London. One size will not fit all. We'll think about Berlin, where even though we have a population of people with COPD, some will need inhaled corticosteroids and some won't. And we have to think about whether you're in the one part of the city part that needs steroids or the other part of the city, the other part of the disease, the ones that doesn't need steroids and make sure we use the treatment appropriately. So my learning points are that COPD and asthma are different conditions. We have different diagnostic pathways. We have different approaches to management, to ICS, inhaled corticosteroids are the cornerstone of asthma treatment bronchodilators are the cornerstone of COPD treatment. But it's not just about treatment, it's about all the other things that Richard's already uh, spoken to us about, about smoking cessation, about pulmonary rehabilitation, about dealing with comorbidities, because we don't look after COPD patients. We look after patients who've got COPD. And because of the nature of the insult, smoking, because of the age of the patient, we're likely to find that patients with COPD have got comorbidities. So let's not forget that patients will have other conditions which deserve our attention every bit as much as patients with COPD. So steroids in my mind are actually quite simple. John laid it out very, very nicely. You can look at two things you need to consider when you, when you, whether to give someone a steroid or not. Number one is the risk of exacerbation. And risk of exacerbation in the main is predicted by previous history of exacerbation, whether it's moderate exacerbations or severe exacerbations. And so gold helps us with that. And then the other thing you need to consider is the bloody eosinophil count because, again, there's clear evidence both prospectively and retrospectively that, that as your eosinophil count increases, your risk of exacerbation goes up, but even better, the response to steroids goes up. I think that's really important to say. So basically, if you haven't had exacerbations, and that's what steroids do is reduce exacerbations, you pretty much don't need an inhaled corticosteroids unless your eosinophil count is significantly elevated. We'll perhaps talk about that. If your eosinophil count is above 300 and you've had exacerbations, you definitely should be on inhaled corticosteroid. If you have an eosinophil count below 100, there is no benefit from the inhaled corticosteroid, as John has said, so you don't need to be on them. And then there's there was a bit in the middle where you have to consider the risk benefit, as John laid out, with pneumonia versus exacerbation risk um, of uh, reduction risk um, of, of the uh, inhaled steroids. And basically, if your eosinophil count is, is, is higher, you've got more risk. So actually, I would consider a high number of exacerbations plus an eosinophil count above 100. I would consider uh, inhaled corticosteroids, but below 100, certainly not. So that's how I kind of see it. I think it's quite simple sure. uh, and people get very, very hung up about it. But the beauty thing is, with the eosinophil counts and the exacerbation risk, is steroids, inhaled corticosteroids, reduce exacerbations. Eosinophils predict response to um, inhaled corticosteroids. And so it's very simple to give them to the right people.
Richard, before we leave that point, I think it's also important for you to comment on the dose of inhaled corticosteroids we use in COPD as opposed to in, well, mild asthma for a start. There's a, there's a big difference there as well. So that's that's a really good point. Let's let's deal with the reduction or the taking them off steroids first of all, because again, I think it's relatively simple. If if there's, if there's always a chicken and egg argument here, right. which which, I'll, which we can have, but if you've if you've not had exacerbations and your eosinophil count is below 100, you should not be on a health corticosteroid. And and it's reasonable, and that's what the RS recommendations are, you can probably stop the steroids abruptly. Sure. If you've not had exacerbation joint eosinophils above 300, you probably should stay on the um, inhaled corticosteroids steroids because the, because the steroids are probably working. I think that's really important to say. Sure. But if your levels are in, in between you and you haven't had exacerbations, then withdrawing people from steroids is a reasonable thing to do. If you've had no exacerbations, the guidelines say, yeah, I, I might actually consider two years um, as, as being a, a proper phenotype changer. Um, now, whether you take them off slowly or immediately abruptly, I think there's very little evidence to help us. But in my practice, I do this in a stepwise way for people with severe airflow obstruction. Because for them, you get a small reduction in, um, in FEV1 when you reduce a steroid, which may be clinically significant. But for someone who's got good, um, good, good airways with reasonable FEV1s, I actually just take, I just stop it completely. And then John's point about um, about the dose of steroids. Do you know what? This is also really difficult because all of the, tr the steroid trials were done with really high doses of steroids compared with what we use for asthma. However, and, and, the, and the benefits were there for to be seen in the people with exacerbations in eosinophils. Um, not many studies were done with lower dose. Some were and were ineffective, but maybe they were looking at the wrong people, so it's hard to say. So we do need more studies on lower dose and corticosteroids. But I have to say, I, I, John, you're, you're right. The, the, the risk of pneumonia increases with dose of steroids, and we do have to use you know, medium to high dose of inhaled steroids in COPD to be sure of the um, inhaled corticosteroid ben benefit with eosinophils. There's been a recent study with ethos, the ethos study, which has shown an effect in the people with high eosinophils of a lower dose of, of inhaled corticosteroids. So this is hinting that maybe we can use lower dose of inhaled corticosteroids, but not recommended at the moment. So thank you all both so much. We have some questions uh, uh, before we end. Uh, and the first question is from uh, a doctor from Nepal. I'm Dr. Pramod Hatta, consultant general practitioner working in the rural setting of Nepal under limited resources. I have a question for today's panelists. Actually, how to differentiate between asthma and COPD? Actually, in our day to day practice, there are a lot of overlap symptoms between COPD and asthma that makes it really difficult to differentiate between asthma and COPD. So if the panelists could differentiate between them and make it clear for us, it could be really helpful for a lot of the practitioners working in the rural setting with limited resources. Thank you. John, you'd like to take that one? So um, we've got to be a little bit careful not to presume that all people with asthma have got similar symptoms and all people with COPD have got similar symptoms. But in general, people with asthma have an intermittent uh, symptom cluster. So they can be well for periods of time with episodes where they are less well. Uh, they often have symptoms that started in childhood. They're often atopic individuals. Um, and so the, 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 one of the features I see in primary care asthma, so let's leave aside the most severe asthma, is that for periods of time, people can be particularly and completely well and this is a good diagnostic uh, feature but also quite a difficult feature in terms of managing uh, managing the patients because they wonder why we are treating them when they feel completely well right. on the other hand you can't really have COPD until you're about 40 because you've got to have a 20 pack year history of smoking so you know you'll find a few people who started smoking very early who have developed uh, uh, COPD before that. But in general, people with COPD are, are less than 40. They'll always have a smoking history or an exposure history. They will have progressive symptoms so that they, 
the, the, the features they have occur day after day. They'll have a reproducibility in terms of their breathlessness. If they can't walk to the shops, they can never walk to the shops. Somebody with asthma <coughs> might have episodes where they can't walk to the shops, but other days they can walk to the shops. So that can't be COPD. So the, the point I, I would really like to make is this idea about COPD doesn't trouble you at night, but asthma does, is a bit of a fallacy. I know lots of patients with COPD who've got symptoms at night. Um, patients who have symptoms mostly in the morning tend to have asthma. I don't think that's true either. Patients with COPD are particularly bad in the morning. It's difficult to get patients with COPD to come to early morning clinic appointments because they just literally can't get up quickly enough. COPD patients and teenagers, they can't get up in the morning. So. There's a, there's a cluster of clinical symptoms that will guide the clinician. And then there's a whole lot of supporting uh, features such as blood eosinophil counts, phenos, and of course, measurements of obstructive airways disease. I think you You can't rely on a trial of treatment to help you with the diagnosis because a short acting beta agonist should uh, make both uh, lots of patients, both asthma and COPD patients, better so don't rely on a trial of treatment to differentiate sure. to make a, a, a diagnosis supported by other features is okay so there's symptom clusters there's objective evidence um, and then two different treatment pathways CG. and would you also add a family history of atop as favoring asthma indeed yeah. so there's not one feature that doesn't because you've got a family history, it doesn't mean you must have sure. asthma and you can't have COPD, but these are little extra pieces in the jigsaw, sure. you know, or, or weights on the balance, which sure. make uh, it possible to make a confident diagnosis one over the other, confirmed by spirometry, reversibility, phenol levels, eosinophil counts, sputum uh, eosinophils, if you work in Richard's department and so on. Super. And the next question, uh, and Richard, I'll pass this to you. I, I will have to get you to come from CO, from a COPD specialist to absolute primary care, stranded on an island. Hi, I'm Dr. Mahesh from Sri Lanka. My question is, I don't have access to spirometer. How can I diagnose COPD? Talk to the patient properly. Talk to them well. Ask the right questions. I don't think it, it you know, to ask you and use your hands. I mean, I, I'm, I'm, I'm actually, you know, I'm actually almost absolutely serious about this. Sure. You know, and and use your face. So basically, it's it's talking, asking the right questions, talking about the impact. What's that, what is actually the problem? Right. What are the symptoms of the patients having? How have they developed? And, and actually, what has been the impact of those symptoms? That also really helps you with treatment. Sure. And then actually um, looking at the way they breathe. You yes. haven't got a spirometry, but you can still ask someone to take a big breath, big breath in and big breath out, hard and fast, like a spirometry. And you can see the pattern of their breathing, which will give you a, a really good understanding of, of diagnosis. And then obviously, from an examination point of view, um, looking for the signs of hyper, remembering sure. COPD is a multi, system disease in a way or has multiple effects anyway of, of looking at the cardiovascular system the the respiratory system with hyperinflation particularly and also then the musculoskeletal system looking for the impact of, of a disease on someone's someone's muscles to find out again what the benefit is sure. because so yeah, i i would love there to be a world where actually uh, we are using those skills with the appropriate tests yes. without necessarily labeling for a diagnosis and having treatments which uh, are individual for a patient that are, that, are, that are following the results for that individual patient, whether it's blood eosinophil count, whether it's a spirometry trace, or whether it's a particular symptom score. It would be wonderful. So, so absolutely. So you can, you can use those things, ask the right questions and, and examine the patient problem. Sure. And, and maybe add in a chest X-ray, especially in a country uh, like India, where I work, you know, to rule out tuberculosis and probably any other cause. And also tuberculosis has significant long-term morbidity in yes. the lung and, and, and is a, a significant cause, not only of bronchiectasis, but also uh, related to chronic airways obstruction sure. and, and, and a type of COPD. Sure. And the third question um, is from Myanmar. Uh, and I put this across to John. Hello, I'm Dr. Sai Sayat from Myanmar. Uh, and I would like to ask, uh, in the era of COVID-19, how to manage our COPD patients? I think in general, um, 
the management of COPD and the management of COVID haven't caused us particular problems in terms of the interaction. Now, there's a few specifics we need to be aware of. For instance, in many parts of the world, spirometry hasn't been conducted for more than a year because of the um, concerns around uh, transmitting infection um, by use by, by conducting spirometry. So we, we've been somewhat hampered. But in terms of the pure management of COPD in the time of COVID, acknowledging that it might be done more remotely and less intensively and so on, nothing's really changed. And in terms of managing COVID in people with COPD, the experience from my hospital is that although outcomes can be different and people have speculated on the roles of different therapies and we, we can presume that people who have a underlying uh, pulmonary uh, uh, comorbidity are going to do less well, the role of managing people with uh, COVID in the presence of COPD is no different to managing COVID in somebody who doesn't have COPD. So there's, there's no particular issues, although the finer points of management are obviously influenced by the fact that uh, the whole healthcare system has changed in terms of person-to-person uh, -person contact. Thank you very much, both of you all again. Uh, and uh, I, I really appreciate your time today. So I would again like to thank you for tuning in and also thank our collaborators, very importantly, which are the Sri Lankan College of Pulmonology, the Myanmar Thoracic Society, AAA and AOSR from Algeria, APPM and AFMAPATH from Morocco, the Iranian Society of Pulmonology, SDNCT and Pneumonaut from the Dominican Republic, the Panama Pneumology Association, and the Yemeni Association for Respiratory Care. And I look forward to meeting you all again in this season two, episode nine, in the near future. Thank you. <laughs>